Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. There's two kinds of people in the world. There's people who do things on purpose and there's people that are passive. Now passive people are people who who want something good to happen but they're not going to really do too much if anything to make it happen. They have a lot of wishbone but no backbone. And then there's people who read the word, they know what's right and they purpose with God's help, which we can't do anything apart from God. Let's establish that first. But here's the other thing we have to remember is anything that God asks us to do, he gives us the ability to do. Anything that you feel that God is leading you to do, God gives you the ability to do that. All we need to do is just keep leaning on him. God, I need you. I need you. I can't do anything without you. Give him the praise, give him the glory, and you'll keep that flow of power coming into your life all the time. And so I decided that I would talk about attitude. Last night we talked about just the power of an attitude, how to have a nose-up attitude instead of a nose-down attitude. If you have a nose-up attitude, then you're always climbing in life. You'll have an above-average life. If you have a nose-down attitude, then you'll always be below average. We'll always have less than what God wants us to have. Now, everybody wants to have a good life. Everybody in this place wants to have a good life. But not everybody, even in here, is doing what you need to be doing to have that good life. It's really like passivity is one of the greatest deceptions from the devil. It's just that I want it, but they go more by how they feel. They wait to feel it before they do it. They wait until everybody else is doing it. You know, there's very few people in the world, I think, when you consider all things, that are willing to do what's right, even if they're the only one that they know that's doing it. We're far too affected by the crowd and what everybody else is doing. And God is looking for people that will swim upstream while everybody else is floating downstream. It's easy to float, but going against the current is not that easy. So this morning in this service, I'm going to talk about having a patient attitude. If you would like to stay for the second service, I'll be teaching on having an unselfish attitude because I really believe that there's a call for all of us to stand up and be counted in this hour that we're living in. Five areas we're going to mention about impatience. There's a lot of different things that we can be impatient with, and some are impatient with some things, but not impatient at all with others. I've overcome certain degrees of impatience in my life because, to be honest, being impatient probably would be my number one weakness. I'm a strong, choleric personality. I want it. I want it now. If I tell you to do it, do it right. Do it the first time. Don't make me tell you again. So, you know, now, I mean, that's the way I started out. Thank God I'm not like that anymore. I mean, I could drift back in that direction if I didn't keep working on this attitude thing. So if you don't need this today, I'll just be happy to preach to myself because I need everything that I say. Amen? So, first of all, I started out, I was very impatient with God. Like, man, I just couldn't understand why I could not get God to do what I wanted him to do. And, you know, even things that God promises in the word that he will do, he doesn't always do on our timetable. Doesn't it frustrate you when you know that God could do something and it wouldn't be difficult for him at all, but yet he just doesn't? So if you could do it in five years, why couldn't you do it in one year? Why did I have to go through all of this stuff? Well, eventually you learn that no matter how aggravated you get, you're not going to rush God. So whatever it is that you're waiting on right now, you might as well learn to wait well because waiting is a fact of life. We all wait, but some people do wait better than other people. So make it easy on yourself. Say, my times are in your hands. I know that you've got a plan for me. No devil in hell, no person on earth can keep you from what God has for you in the perfect time when you're prepared and ready. There's a lot of things that God has prepared for us, but he's got to get us prepared for those things that he has us ready for. I tell you, it's tough sometimes when you've got a dream in your heart and you see it so clear. Oh, man, you see it so clear. 
and you know it's what God wants for you. It's hard to understand many times that although that is exactly right, God does have that for you. It is his will that he's preparing you now for the thing he's got prepared for you. Not everybody is ready for everything when they think they are. We think we're ready, but we're not always. Now, impatience with people. How many of you sometimes get impatient with people? You know, people who, well, let, let's just think about some of the things that we could be impatient with when it comes to people. Let's just say, uh, um, how do you act while you're waiting in line? <laughs> what about if you have a slow clerk? What about a clerk who's new and doesn't know what they're doing? What if the person in front of you has three items with no prices and then they have to go on a search in the store <laughs> to find the prices? Okay, well, now see, I've, I've gotten good at this. I can do that because I just about lost my salvation over slow clerks 30 years ago. <laughs> I mean, it was like I just, I'd have my big flashy rhinestone Jesus pin on and you know, all my Christian jewelry, and I'd be in the grocery store line, had three little kids then, and they were all driving me crazy, and I had my plan. I wanted to get those groceries, get through that line, get them in the car, get them home, put them away, and then do something else. I had my plan. Don't mess up my plan. <laughs> Anybody like that? All right. And so, I don't care. I mean, I got to the point where I would pray about which line to get in. <laughs> I mean, I would stand by, okay, now, Lord, you know ahead of time what's going to happen. You know I'm in a hurry, Lord. Which one of these lines is going to go the fastest? And I don't care what I did, I'd always get in the one that was going to be slow. Something's going to be broke. There's no prices. And I'm telling you what, I mean, if you could have died from frustration, I would have been dead because that's how aggravated it made me. I just didn't get it. God, what are you doing to me? And then I would go into the, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are not going to steal my joy. You are not going to steal my peace. I finally got it. God was using that on me. Because the word patience, actually, if you study it in the Vines Greek Dictionary, now get this, it says it is a fruit of the Spirit that only grows under trial. <laughs> we can't pray this on you. It only grows under trial. So obviously, people don't want to get stuff on patience because they figure when they start praying for patience, they're going to get trouble. And actually, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> However, the Bible says when you are perfect, when you, when you have this perfect patience, when a man is patient, he is perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I can be in this line and not want to be through the line and somewhere else. I can just be there and enjoy it. So I finally managed to master the slow clerk thing. Then we went to no clerks. I mean, I'd get to the point where I'd want to pay for something in a store and couldn't even find anybody to take my money. And I thought, this is escalating to something that's not going to be pretty. <laughs> How do you act when you tell somebody to do something and they don't do it the first time you tell them, and you have to tell them again and again. And it's like, can you not hear? Did you not hear me tell you that? How do you act when you ask somebody for something, they bring you something totally different than what you asked for? <laughs> See, then, then the attitude comes out. It, it doesn't even have to be words. It's on your face. It's like, <laughs> don't you love it? Just like. So what are we saying with our facial expressions? You are so stupid. <laughs> and what we do many times with our bad attitude is we make people that are really, honestly, truly doing their best. Just because people don't have the same gifts or strengths that I do or you do doesn't mean that they're not valuable. And to be honest, God does put us with people that irritate us and he does it on purpose. It won't do you any good to try to get away from the batch you've got now because you'll get a new batch wherever you go. Because the thing is, is 
God uses those things on us to polish the rough edges off of us. And, and here's a flash for you. He's using you on somebody else. So let's just don't go thinking we've got it all together because <laughs> if you think that other person's personality bothers you, you ought to get them to tell you the truth about how they feel about you. Hmm. So God's got a plan. Impatience. So I finally got that one. I'm, I, I really think, by and large, most of the time, I treat people pretty good, and I've really kind of gotten the deeper revelation from God that it really offends him when we mistreat people, and so we really do need to get out there and try to be decent to people because everybody's got a story. We just haven't heard it. And everybody's hurting, and everybody's going through something, and you know, even somebody who just seems to be purposely mean, if they're like that, they've got something in their life that's hurting them or something that has hurt them. And if we're going to represent Christ, then we, we really need to develop a more patient attitude with people. So I dare you to start praying about patience. I saw that face, John. What do you think? You think, can you do this? I'm glad I got somebody new to pick on when I come here. I think I can pick on him. And then... You can also be impatient with yourself. And I went through a lot of that, and I, I, I pretty much gotten over that. I finally just told God one day, look, this is what it is. You knew what you were getting when you got me. <laughs> if you didn't want to put up with me, you should have picked on somebody else. And I'm tired of apologizing for myself. Not that God was ever asking me to. But the thing is, you got to learn how to enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. You have to learn how to enjoy yourself while you're in the process of growing in God. Can I say this again? Learn how to enjoy yourself. Learn how to enjoy yourself. Learn how to enjoy yourself with all of your imperfections and your weaknesses, knowing that you are no surprise to God. He knows dumb stuff that we're going to do that we haven't even done yet, and he's already pre-decided to love us unconditionally and to work with us all the way through and never give up on us. So just be patient with yourself. Then there's the area of being patient with objects and things. Now, I'm not so good at this. Can I have my little props there? There is something that I have a big problem with, and I'm going to ask you to pray for me, and that is packaging. I just cannot, I mean, I can almost lose my salvation over packaging. Okay, this is just a bottle of eye drops. I got these out this morning, went, oh, no. <laughs> Come on, any of you do that? I'm like... <clears throat> And then I'll go like, what is the matter with people? They sell you this stuff and don't expect you to get into it and use it. <laughs> well, now, Dave says, why don't you just get a pair of scissors? Cut that off. <laughs> well, because that would take patience for me to walk across the room and find the scissors <laughs> and come back and do that. I don't like that. Then you go to the mouthwash. Oh, my gosh, not again. I just... <clears throat> and see, I have these. Ooh, well, that one's coming. Yay. Oh, but it's still not working. Ugh. So this year, packaging is my goal. I'm going to get to the point where I'm free from being upset by packaging. Now, you know, the way that you get free from something is you go through it over and over and over and over until it just don't bother you anymore. You finally die to it. See, I can get in a line now where somebody's slow and it's just like, <laughs> not this time, devil, been there, done that. I'm keeping my peace. Uh -huh. But the packaging thing, I still have to master. I also have another little issue that I'll let you in on. I have one piece of hair right here. Now, I'll show you what it does. You see that? Okay. I don't care what we do to that, it's going to stick out, so I'm always going to. 
Okay, yesterday I got mad at it, and I thought, I'm cutting that dude off. <laughs> so I got my scissors out. Well, now I've got it really way too short, so it just made it a whole lot worse. How many of you have things in your life like this, just some little thing that you just can't hardly stand? And then there's this whole area of, and this is also a goal of mine. These last two are like my things. You can't fully enter into what you're doing because you're mentally already onto the next thing. I see some of you are here this morning, but you're not here. Because you're already thinking about what you need to do when you get home. And so we're never anywhere unless we've got our mind where we're at. Just because our body's there, that doesn't mean that we're there. And I don't know, I guess it's just part of the choleric, aggressive personality, but I have trouble staying where I'm at. I always am kind of like moving on to the next thing because I'm purposeful, I'm aggressive, I've got a plan, we're doing this, let's get to that. So I have this thing where when I'm riding in a car, when we get close to our home and it's in view, I take the seat belt off and start preparing <laughs> to get out of the vehicle. Not too long ago, my daughter said to me, Mother, would you let me park the car before you get out of it? When we park at a parking lot, I am out of the car, got all my stuff, and in the store, and Dave is still gathering his stuff up out of the car. I'm like, how could anybody take that long to get out of the car? What are you doing? How many of you are real fast, quick people? Okay. How many of you are like more easy going slow and you get tired of all of us that are fast and quick? And I can pretty much guarantee you that a fast one's married to a slow one. And a slow one's married to a fast one. Come on now. I mean, it's like, okay, God, are we having fun yet or what? I don't, this is, this is, after 47 years, this isn't funny anymore. I tell you, that whole scripture in Genesis, and a man shall leave his father and mother, and he shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Doesn't that sound beautiful? But I tell you, it's the becoming that's the problem. And it's an ongoing, never-ending problem. All right, now, let's get down to business. We've had some fun. First of all, if you don't have any patience with God, and if I don't have any patience with God, I'm going to get into what the Bible calls works of the flesh. And works of the flesh are my bright ideas on how to get what I want in my timing <laughs> instead of waiting on God. And I tell you, we all make some of the most ridiculous messes in our lives getting ahead of God. We see it in Genesis. I'm not going to take time to tell the whole story, but surely you'll realize that when God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would have a child and child wasn't coming, child wasn't coming, child wasn't coming, they're getting tired of waiting Sarah gets a bright idea. Ladies, have you ever had a bright idea? Okay. Well, I was very good at bright ideas. And they, and they come something like this. You're going along, you're like, I know what God wants me to do. Your husband's not saved, so you think, or maybe you're, maybe you're married to somebody who's got a bad attitude. You've already decided you're going to buy those five books on attitude. And you're going to open those dudes up and lay them everywhere you can in the house because now you have a plan on how you can get his attitude fixed. How many of you know nothing works unless it originates with God? Listen, he is the author and the finisher, and he told me a long time ago, I am not obligated to finish anything I didn't start. If you start it, it's your baby. So we really need to learn how to works, work the works of God and not get into works of the flesh. You say, well, how can I tell the difference? Well, works of the flesh are works that don't work. 
It's us trying to make something happen that is just not happening, and we just don't understand why it's not happening, and we sound like this. God, I've just done everything I know to do. And I just don't understand why this isn't working. And then sometimes we get very dramatic, which doesn't impress God at all, and we will even fall in the floor. I just, I give up. I just, I just give up. I, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Come on, sound like anybody you know. Well, the truth is, is God is not really asking us to do anything except believe, and then when we do get an instruction from him to obviously then do what we believe that God is telling us to do. We have to learn how to stay out of works of the flesh. I absolutely just about killed myself with works of the flesh, trying to make my ministry grow, trying to change my husband, trying to change my kids, trying to change myself, trying not to try. I mean, it was just like... <laughs> Truly, if anybody could have died from frustration, it would have been me. And I finally realized that frustration equals works of the flesh. Anytime that you feel frustrated, now listen, anytime you feel frustrated or I feel frustrated, it's because I'm trying to make something happen that only God can make happen. Did you hear me? Come on, that's worth putting up on a sign. I had one in my house for a long time. Works of the flesh equal frustration. I had to put that thing on my mirror. I had to put it on my refrigerator because I was just a very aggressive, active, get a plan, get an idea, go for it type person. Well, I've finally gotten over that, but some of you here probably have not. You're probably still in that area and you're frustrating yourself trying to get rid of things that only God can get rid of trying to change people, which is something only God can do. Can I tell you something? You can't make one of your relatives love God. I don't care how much you want the right thing for them. If they don't want it for themselves, you are just spinning your wheels and you are going to ruin your life and miss your joy. And the far better thing to do is pray for them and let God work. And, and let me just tell you, when you pray for somebody, don't expect them to act better. They're probably going to act worse before they act better. You say, why? Because when you pray for people, God begins to deal with them. And when God deals with us, if we're not ready to give in, it makes us act worse instead of better. You ever prayed for anybody and you're like, well, that didn't work. <laughs> They're worse than ever. I used to pray for Dave not to love sports so much because I didn't like him. And so I didn't want him to like him if I didn't like him. And And, uh, I mean, you know, you've heard me say it probably. He loves anything that rolls or bounces. I don't care what it is. <laughs> and uh, when I grew up, my dad never let me do anything. I was just basically manipulated and controlled and could never even remember being happy when I was in my 20s. And Dave played all these sports growing up, and he just loves it all. I mean, anything, he loves it. And, I mean, I started praying for him not to not to do so much of this, not to do so much of that, and trying to get him to change. And honestly, and this is true, I walked in the room one night where he was sitting, and he was watching a football game, listening to a baseball game, and, sh and clean it, shining his golf clubs, and I thought, you know what, this isn't working. <laughs> Come on, could somebody get a realization today that what you're doing isn't working? Anybody? It's just not working. So why not take a vacation <laughs> from works of the flesh and let God be God in your life? Amen. You know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we all have the fruit of patience in our spirits. God has put it there as a seed. But we have to develop it. God wants us to develop that and to, and to become strong in that fruit of patience. And the way that we do develop it is by having opportunities to use it. And you know, sometimes God wants us to wait patiently on His timing so He doesn't do what we'd like Him to do right away. He wants us to trust Him in all things and to really learn how to enjoy every single moment of our lives. And that's not gonna happen if we're frustrated and upset all the time. 
because things aren't happening as fast as we would like them to. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. <laughs> Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl. Or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding. And do something that you know will make a difference.